although um, my name is Gillian Roberts, I'm a, as Janet's already said, a consultant rheumatologist at the RHP. Well, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear my own voice very loudly, so it's not too much. Um, thanks very much to Janet and her team for organising this afternoon and all the hard work that that involves. I'm just going to talk a little bit about SLA and pregnancy and then just a little bit about some new medications at, at the end. So why is pregnancy such an important topic in, in SLE or lupus? It's nine times more common in women um, and the typical age of onset is between 15 and 40, although obviously people at any age can be diagnosed with it. So typically we're, we're talking about women of childbearing age. It's said that lupus is associated with high, that higher problems for both the mum and potentially the baby and there is also concerns that, that the illness itself could potentially flare during pregnancy. So, just to, uh, to summarise and then we'll, we'll go on to a bit more detail, women with lupus don't seem to have any more difficulty be becoming pregnant, fertility is, is fairly similar to the general population, the very common types of early miscarriage that are common to all women don't seem to be any different, um, but there are other aspects that, that, that women with lupus have, have more difficulty with. Um, high blood pressure, conditions such as preeclampsia, um, intrauterine growth retardation for the baby doesn't grow quite as effectively, um, baby's been born early and baby's been born um, with a lower weight than ideal, appear to be a bit more common in women with lupus. How big a problem is this? Now there's been lots of studies done throughout the world um, looking at this to try and work out is this a problem and how big is a problem and what can we do about it? There was one particular lupus clinic in Barcelona looked at these risks in, the, in their own population of pa patients which is relatively similar to our population here in Scotland. Um, they looked at um, 60 women who between them had had 103 pregnancies, a reasonably long time ago now, um, and this was published in the British Society of Rheumatology's journal in 2002. One of the things they wanted to look at are, are do women, does lupus flare more commonly in pregnancy than normal? And that, that's the perception of, and was this correct? Um, looking at this, they felt that two-thirds of, of women had a problem with their arthritis flaring up um, and a third of women felt that their skin had got a little bit worse. Kidneys flared up in some people. Overall, they felt it was towards the end of the pregnancy um, and after the baby was born. They compared this to women who weren't pregnant and felt it was maybe slightly higher, but overall there wasn't a massive difference. However, what they did stress was that there was a massive difference in women who had become pregnant when their lupus was active as opposed to women whose disease was nice and quiet at the time they had become pregnant and they looked at this specifically so women who had um, their disease was well under control and they looked at the difference of complications um, a complication of high blood pressure and other complications later on in pregnancy called preeclampsia was much more common in women whose disease was active um, people whose disease was active at the time they became pregnant were much more likely to have a flare of their disease. Um, they were more likely to go into labour early um, and they were more likely to have babies that were smaller than ideal and born a little bit early. thought it would be useful just to have a wee look and see how does that compare to pregnancies in women who, who don't have lupus. And in the UK about 6% of women will develop preeclampsia which is very similar to patients with controlled lupus. But babies been born a bit early, so less than 37 weeks, and babies been born a little bit small. Um, if you look back at that, women with lupus do tend to have slightly higher risks of that. So about 20% as opposed to roughly 10%. So a little bit higher complications in women with lupus for these particular complications. There's a proportion of women with, with lupus also have a, another syndrome associated with this called antiphospholipid syndrome. Um, and this is where in your blood you've got presence of antibodies and um, the ones we measure in our labs here are ones called lupus anticoagulant or anticardiolipin antibodies and if you have these antibodies in your blood you're more likely to get certain complications. Um, blood clots and veins and arteries are much more common and you're more likely to have miscarriages and other pregnancy complications and this particular group had noticed that the patients who had antiphospholipid antibodies were more likely to have problems with babies being born early um, and small babies um, and, and late pregnancy loss and stillbirth. So they felt that this subgroup of patients were the patients that were causing most concern. <laughs> what has become really relevant over the last 
10 to 20 years is that identifying patients with antiphospholipid syndrome is vitally important because recognising that and treating it dramatically improves the presence of pregnancy complications related to that. This doesn't protect particularly well this table but the first column looks at before treatment and the second column after treatment so it's showing you the rate of um, babies that are that are lost before effective treatment which was very high and almost completely reversed these with effective treatment so this has been one of the massive improvements over the last couple of decades in identifying this problem this is a very complicated slide i'm just going to just this was um, from um, what the treatment of antiphospholipid syndrome is i'm just going to focus really just on the last bit so if you're known to have anti antiphospholipid syndrome and it's been picked up before you were pregnant um, if you are thought to be at risk, um, then treating with heparin and aspirin um, in people who are selected to be um, relevant for this really dramatically improves this. So it's very important that if you're thought to be at risk or have had previous pregnancies with complication, that you get started on appropriate treatment um, in order to reduce those risks. Um, so, like lots of things with lupus, it's never entirely clear cut as to what the treatment is. Um, at the moment, if you've got these antibodies but never had any problems, it might be advisable not to have any treatment. But if you've had previously pregnancies with complications, it's essential that you get, you get treatment and most obstetricians would recommend that aspirin and heparin injections would be the most effective treatment. The other big area of concern um, is, is women with lupus who have, who have kidney problems and they are felt to be the other risk group that are slightly higher. Um, if you've got kidney impairment and you've had problems with lupus nephritis, you're more likely to have high blood pressure and then more likely to have some of the other complications such as preeclampsia um, and problems with growth retardation um, and babies being a bit smaller than they should be. Um, this particular group looked at this and felt that the risk was a little bit higher but those women whose, whose kidneys were very well under control for six months or so before their pregnancies had pretty good outcomes and again focusing on the fact that we need to time this and do this pretty well. So, people always worry when, when they have an autoimmune condition, can my antibodies cause problems and can the antibodies pass through the placenta? Well, in a, in a very small proportion of women they, they, they can, particularly if you've got antibodies in your blood called Gro or La antibodies. And there's a condition called neonatal lupus syndrome where the antibodies pass through the placenta and it can cause quite dramatic rashes in babies, an example of that there. It can cause some blood and liver blood death abnormalities, but it's very temporary and it can look quite dramatic. Things usually settle down after a relatively short period of time. But it's important that people are aware that this might happen and your obstetrician is aware this might happen. But it settles down and the antibodies um, settle again. One aspect that's potentially of a bit more concern of women who have these antibodies, these Rho and La antibodies in their blood, which um, your rheumatologist should know whether you've got these antibodies, it occurs very, very rarely in, in all women, and there is a small risk, a tiny risk of 0.005%, but it's a little bit higher in women who have these antibodies. And again, it's something that your obstetrician would be aware of and would do um, a fetal, fetal heart scan. And if it's, very, if it's picked up, then there can be effective treatments such as a pacemaker for the baby put in place. And this is where the baby's heart would be slower than ideal and might need a pacemaker to correct it. So it's, it's very rare even in women with lupus, um, and it can be effectively diagnosed and treated effectively if you know about it in advance. So what medicines are safe and what medicines are not safe in, in women who are wanting to become pregnant and have lupus? Well, hydroxychloroquine, which is a, a very commonly prescribed anti-malarial drug, is safe and can be taken all the way through pregnancy and breastfeeding and in fact would be actively recommended for women to take rather than to discontinue. There are some other medications such as azathioprine um, and a small dose of steroids that if necessary would be safe to be taken. Um, lots of people take anti-inflammatory medications for, for joint pain and other symptoms and these can be taken during the middle of pregnancy but are best avoided and there may be other ways of other pain relief that needs to be managed. What medicines are absolutely not safe during pregnancy? Well this is a short list and there are other ones but methotrexate, people who need to know methotrexate would need to try and plan to be off that for at least three months. The, another drug that's, that's commonly used in people with, with kidney problems might be mycophenolate um, and these other drugs here would need to be discontinued. So looking 
through this particular group and, and looking through lots of experience. The most important thing about women with lupus who want to be pregnant is to plan this in advance. And really as far in advance as possible, and actually speaking to your rheumatologist, even up to one to two years before the idea that you might want to have a baby is really useful to make sure that your disease is as stable as possible and to make sure that any medications that need to be discontinued can be discontinued well in advance. Ideally, your lupus should be stable for at least six months. And if that is the case, the, the, the risk of complications is significantly less. And also identifying things like antiphospholipid syndrome that might require treatment. All these things are, are put in place and timing and good advice is given. But actually, most women with lupus can go and have very successful pregnancies and have normal healthy babies. Um, and the study I showed you was relatively old and things are improving all the time. The most important thing is good planning and making sure that, that you are discuss this with your, your doctor and get referred to any other specialists that you need to. So just going to talk very, very briefly just a little bit about some, some treatments and some treatments of lupus um, throughout time. Now, corticosteroids, penicillin being the most commonly prescribed one, dramatically changed the outcome of, of lupus in the 1950s and lots of other um, autoimmune conditions like rheumatoid arthritis. You went from patients with life-threatening conditions who wouldn't survive, who responded well to treatment and, and the outlook looked much, much better. It's still, steroids are still a very important treatment, particularly for some serious manifestations, but there are lots and lots of concerns that long-term treatment with steroids can cause problems, um, and there is concern that we can cause our patients as many problems with steroids and without steroids, and they have to be used very carefully and very sparingly. Um, so we have to think as, as rheumatologists, can we use other treatments other than steroids? Um, one of the most important medications um, is one of the anti-malarial drugs called hydroxychloroquine. There are other ones around, but that is the one that is most commonly used. It's very effective for helping the skin and joints, thought to reduce the amount of flares. Some rheumatologists say it should be in the water, because they think it's, that every person with lupus should really be on hydroxychloroquine. It seems to offset some of the adverse um, problems that, that some patients with lupus with higher cardiovascular risk have. And it's relatively free of side effects, there's concerns over uh, problems with, with retinal problems in the eyes over long term use, but again if we use stable doses and low doses and monitor that closely, the chances of that are very, very small. Oops. My slides seem to have frozen. much about these and a list of other medications that we can use for, for different manifestations of, of lupus um, but I was really just wanting to talk a little bit about some of the, the newer medications that and it's talking about biological medications and as rheumatologists who also manage rheumatoid arthritis biological medications have transformed the lives of lots of patients with rheumatoid arthritis and it would be nice if we could also transform the lives of lots of our patients with lupus as well Biological medications essentially means medications that are used from biological components, often antibodies, rather than being made totally synthetically. A biological drug called rituximab is now part of our mainstay of treatment for rheumatoid arthritis. It was used for a treatment for lymphoma before then and still is, and it's a drug that we're, we're very familiar with. Um, it reduces um, the it controlled B cells um, and alters um, that, and it was felt that this should be very effective in lupus. So there's been some big clinical studies looking at this. Um, the, the two main ones were one called Lunar that looked at women, uh, looked at patients with lupus and kidney problems, and one that looked at patients with other sorts of lupus manifestations. But unfortunately, neither of those studies managed to convincingly show that rituximab was a very clear and good treatment. Anecdotally, a lot of rheumatologists have used this um, for patients who haven't responded to other treatments and have felt that in isolated cases that has been useful. Um, but the big studies so far have not been convincing for this to be a mainstay treatment of, of, of lupus. There's a study um, currently ongoing in London called Rituxiloop um, by Liz Lightbody and her team there um, who really want to de devise a way to treat lupus nephritis, um, which is one of the most serious manifestations of lupus, using rituximab and mycophenolate, essentially to avoid using steroids, as I was saying earlier, we want to minimise that. We're still waiting for the results of that and we're optimistic that we may get some improvements um, in our treatment options. 
Um, the only other drug I wanted to mention is a drug called belimumab, which is the only drug that's actually been approved for use in SLE. All of our other drugs we have stolen from other conditions and, and used it. Um, it's a monoclonal antibody that binds to a, a type of, of B cells called B lymphocytes, which gives it a nice name of bliss. Um, it decreases antibody production, and this is thought to be really potentially very useful in the treatment of lupus. There was two major trials that you get the, the nice names of Bliss 52 and Bliss 76. Um, there were some aspects of these trials that felt that this might be very effective in, in lupus. Some aspects of the trials thought it wasn't really very clear. Um, in the USA, they were they were reasonably happy with this, and it's become a standard treatment. Um, NICE and the, and the Scottish equivalent, the SMC, have really felt that we don't have convincing evidence from these studies yet and we need more studies to find out its place. Um, and it's really not a standard treatment um, for lupus as yet, but there's still ongoing work to say could drugs like this or similar drugs to this be used in some patients with lupus in order to improve on the treatments that we already have. Why is it so difficult to find new treatments in SLE? In rheumatoid arthritis, we've been finding new treatments all the time, and although we haven't managed to cure rheumatoid arthritis, we've managed to make big impacts. We haven't managed to do that quite successfully as yet in lupus. As so mentioned earlier on, we are decades away from, from cure or effective treatment in lupus. Um, it's a complicated multi-system illness. Um, there are very rarely two people with exactly the same manifestations of their illness. Um, different aspects of the disease often require different types of treatment. Um, clinical trials so far have allowed people to stay on their steroids and other treatments and that has made it really <coughs> difficult to work out whether the new drugs are helping or not. Um, it's difficult to monitor it and to get work out in clinical trials. You might get your skin gets better but one other aspect gets worse. Is that a good outcome or a poor outcome? And it has been very difficult so far to really prove that these new treatments, where their role is in everyday treatment of lupus. So we're still working on it and hopefully things will improve over time. Um, but at the moment, um, our new biological drugs are a small part of lupus management rather than a major part of lupus management. And hopefully in years to come we can have, have much better treatments. Um, and really, just as I've said already, there are a lot of promising new medications and research, but not quite there, there yet for everyday clinical practice, but, but getting there. And we just need a bit more experience and a bit more time to work out which drugs going to help which patients and hopefully make a big impact on things. And I think we're going to do questions.